Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to EDP and Applied Mathematics Seminar. It's a pleasure for me to open session 196 of this seminar. Today, we have two excellent speakers, Giovanni Fantuzzi and Son John Kuhn. Introducing Giovanni Fantuzzi, we have the Professor Luz de Teresa. Thank you, Luz. You can start. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Juan. So it's a pleasure to present Giovanni Fantuzzi. He's uh, an Italian professor that works in Erlangen in this moment. And he has a PhD in aeronautics. So it's, uh, I think it's very different from the things we hear in general, but uh, we are very pleased to have here. So you can start Giovanni, please. Thank you. Um, thanks for the introduction. Thanks for the invitation. Um, I'm afraid I will not present anything to do with aerospace, although maybe the motivation comes from problems that are related to, to my background in, in engineering. Um, but, um, but instead, I will talk about something called moments, sums of squares, relaxation for variational problems, which are somehow common in, in applied maths. Uh, and I want to mention before starting that this is joint work with, uh, with Alexander Czerniaski, Jason Bramburger, David Goloski, Ian Tobasco, and Federico Fuentes in various guises and, and part of basically everything that I will say is already uh, uploaded either to archive or published in, in some German articles, which um, the, the links for which are on the slide, but also I will give um, links later on in the talk at the end. The motivation for the talk uh, is to study problems that have a variational nature. Uh, so examples come from wrinkling patterns where a material deforms in order to minimize a stored elastic energy. Uh, maybe microstructure formation where again a material forms instead of deforms uh, in order to minimize the, the energy that it stores. But also problem that comes from fluid mechanics, for example, optimal cooling, which you see here at the bottom of the slide. So suppose you have a domain, say a disk. Uh, which has a boundary which is cold, hence blue, and the domain is heated inside. Then the question is, how should we stir this the fluid inside this domain in order to remove the heat as much as quickly as possible? So, for example, we could have a flow that has some nice roll-like structures, like you see here on the left, uh, or you could have a flow that has a branching-like structure. And perhaps you could do, pose the same problem where you have a hot boundary here at the bottom at the bottom of a domain, and maybe a cold one at the top. How do you transport heat from the bottom to the top as efficiently as possible? So again, there are there is a variational nature of these problems. We want to optimize something, heat transfer or elastic energy. And the problem is to somehow determine what the best solution should be. Uh, or maybe if we can guess a solution, determine how far it is from being optimal. Right. So this is the general motivation. For this talk, I will take a mathematical model of these questions, and I will take the simplest possible one, which looks um, as follows. So we have an integral functional uh, over some domain omega of a function f that depends on x, which is the space coordinate inside this domain, and then u, which is a vector valued function, which perhaps describes the velocity of a, of a fluid inside the domain, or maybe a deformation of a material, and perhaps even it depends on the gradient. Uh, for example, the strain energy of, of, the, um, of a material. And for simplicity, I will assume that this function u satisfies homogeneous Dirichlet boundary conditions on the boundary of the domain. So it belongs to the space W1P0 uh, on the domain with value is in Rm, so m values. The assumptions that I will put on these problems are pretty standard. So we have some coercivity, we have some growth. We have some notion of convexity or rather quasi-convexity, and this is a standard so that there is a minimizer. So there is a function u in this subordinate space that optimizes um, this integral functional. The only non-standard assumption is here highlighted in orange. It is that the integrand, this f function, is a polynomial function of its argument. And the reason is that I would like to use techniques for polynomial optimization to attack this problem. In particular, what I will talk about today is how to find upper and lower bounds on the minimum value of our problem, uh, which turn out to be quite challenging problems, especially if, if f, the integrand, is not a convex function. Now, the upper bound, you might think it's easy, because if I want to minimize and I want an upper bound, I just take my favorite u, 
But if I want a good upper bound, then I need to find a good function u to plug in here. And finding a good one is, is definitely not an easy problem. The lower bound is even harder on the face of it, uh, at least, because you have to make a statement that applies for every function u in the subpolar space. You can't just choose one, two, or three. Right, so to begin with, that is a that is a harder problem. So the plan of the talk is to explain how to solve these problems using polynomial optimizations. And so I will start with a review of tools from polynomial optimization, which perhaps many of you have never seen before. Uh, and then I will uh, explain how to look for lower bounds using these techniques uh, and for the upper bounds uh, in the end. And I should say now that uh, I'm very happy to take any questions during the talk. So if there is anything, just do interrupt and ask. Uh, I think it is important that we're always on the same page. So let me start with the first part of the talk, where I forget about integral minimization problems and variations. Uh, and I talk about finite dimensional optimization problems over polynomials. So I have a polynomial f, which depends on some variable xi, which is a vector in Rd. Uh, and I have some constraints, which are also polynomial inequalities. So here, the function g1 to gs are polynomial functions. And I just want to minimize f subject to these constraints, which is a finite dimensional standard nonlinear problem. The issue is that because these functions are nonlinear, the problem is non-convex. There is a lot of local minima, stationary points, which are not necessarily the global optimum. Right, so solving this problem, even in this simpler setting, turns out to be computationally quite challenging. The idea to get around this challenge is to take this nice finite dimensional problem, a non-linear problem, and lift it up into a linear problem over an infinite dimensional space. Now, there are two ways of doing this. So let, let K be the, um, the feasible set. Um, of our polynomial optimization problem. So the set of points that satisfy the constraints. Um, and then I can do, do uh, two things. I can either look for the minimi, minimum of the expectation of f over probability measure, which are supported on this feasible set k. Or I can maximize a lower bound lambda for the polynomial f, uh, which needs to hold for every point c in the feasible set. The idea of the second um, reformulation is actually quite intuitive. If you imagine a constant and pushing up the constant until you hit your polynomial f on the um, uh, on the feasible set k, well, then you, you hit the minimum, right? And so that gives you the minimum value. Now, the nice thing about these two reformulations, either the major theoretic one or the second one for the lower bound, is that they are linear problems in the sense that the minimization over mu is linear because this integral is a linear function of mu. And here, the maximization of lambda is also a linear function of lambda, the objective. And in the constraint, lambda appears linearly. Of course, I've just moved the difficulty because I started with a finite dimensional nonlinear problem. And now I have linear problems, either for mu or for lambda, but over much harder spaces. So in one case, I have a probability, um, a space of probability measures, which is significantly harder to handle than Rd. Uh, and in the second case, okay, I have a scalar parameter that I'm optimizing. But if you look at the constraints, I basically have an uncountable number of constraints. So I can't possibly check them all with a computer. So on the one hand, these linear formulations are interesting. On the other hand, it looks like I've just moved the, the difficulty around. Now, the interesting observation, if I look at this non-negativity constraint here, is that although this constraint is difficult, it turns out that there are tractable ways of approximating it. And the tool is something called a sums of squares polynomial. And the name says it all. There are polynomial sigmas over here that can be written as the sum of squares of other polynomials. So we have k terms here. Now, of course, if I have a sum of squares, then this polynomial is non-negative, right? So uh, sums of, being a sum of squares is sufficient for non-negativity. The interesting fact for a computational perspective is that these sums of squares are computationally tractable. And the reason is that they admit a very nice matrix representation where we take a positive semi-definite matrix Q and you sandwich it between two vectors that list basically monomials of, of your variables. 
And looking for such a representation amounts to looking for a positive semi-definite matrix, which is a problem which is finite dimensional and can be uh, attacked with algorithms from optimization from the field of semi-definite programming. I don't want to say much more about this. This could be a talk in itself. Um, uh, it suffices to say for the purposes of today that sums of squares polynomials are computationally tractable and we can use them. So if I go back to the problem of checking our lower bound inequality on the polynomial F over some feasible set K defined by polynomial inequalities, well, then the idea would be to use these sums of squares in order to verify this. Of course, you could ask for F minus lambda here to just be a sums of squares polynomial, which would imply no negativity, but this would be too strong. And this would be too strong because we would have no negativity everywhere, whereas really we just care about points in the set K. In order to account for this set, we can slightly modify the idea and use something called a weighted sums of squares representation, where instead of just having a single sums of squares polynomial here on the right hand side, which should equal f minus lambda, I add the polynomial g that define my set k over here, and I weight them by other sums of squares polynomial sigma, which basically act almost as Lagrange multipliers um, for the constraints of my polynomial optimization problem. And this weighted sums of squares representation, if it exists, guarantees that f minus lambda is non-negative for all xi on the set k, because all of the terms here on the right are non-negative when xi is in the set. And this is a tractable representation, which we can search for using a, a computer. So just to wrap things up uh, and, and see the idea all in once, um, we started with a polynomial optimization problem, minimizing a polynomial f subject to some polynomial inequality constraints. The first step was to lift the problem into an infinite dimensional linear problem with, in this case, a polynomial inequality constraint, which is intractable. But then we can take this inequality and enforce it using weighted sums of squares. And this basically projects down our, our problem uh, into uh, a semi-definite program where we search for semi-definite matrices or sums of squares polynomials. There's an isomorphism between these two, so it's the same. Uh, the only one thing that we have to do is fix the degree of the sigma zero and the sigma i's because a computer can only work with finitely many variables. So there is this parameter omega here, which I will call the relaxation order, just to keep in line with the literature. Uh, which determines the degree of, of these sums of squares polynomials here. Now, because I fixed the degree of these polynomials, and mostly because I replace a non-negativity constraint with a sufficient weighted sums of squares condition, the maximum value of lambda that I compute using this problem is in fact a lower bound on the minimum f star of my original problem. Nevertheless, I will show you in a moment that these lower bounds are actually pretty good. Now, there is an alternative approach, which is called a moment relaxation, which basically starts with the moment reformulation, the major theoretic reformulation of the polynomial optimization problem, uh, and optimizes down here over variables y alpha, which basically mimic the, um, the moments of the probability measure mu. Now, the details of these other reformulations are not important. I just mention it because it, these y's come into this fundamental theorem in the theory of polynomial optimization, which is very important for this talk. Now, there are three statements in this theorem. The first is that the lower bounds that we compute using this weighted sums of squares technology are non-decreasing if we increase the degree of mega of the polynomials. So if you take sums of squares of higher and higher degree, then your bounds become better and better. Moreover, if the polynomial optimization problem has a compact feasible set, then we have convergence. And this is what I meant a minute ago when I said that these lower bounds are very good, uh, because if you can increase the degree of the polynomials as much as you would like, then you can approximate the global minimum of your polynomial as accurately as you like. And then finally, the reason why I mentioned this moment relaxation, instead of just working with the sums of squares polynomials, is that if my polynomial optimization problem has a unique minimizer C star, then I can basically recover it by looking at these values Y alpha because they will converge to powers of the optimizer. And so in summary, just to put it all in a, in a small, in a couple of sentences, 
if we are dealing with polynomial optimization problems in finite dimensions, then we can use sums of squares to have tractable approximations, both of the global minimum and also of the global minimizer. So this by itself is already quite a, a remarkable result. Um, it has been known for about 15, 20 years, but what I want to do really for the rest of the talk is to take this technology and go back to the variational problems that I started the talk with. Um, and in particular, I want to start by computing lower bounds on the minimum of an integral functional over a, a subolid space, which is now an infinite dimensional problem. So the idea to do this is actually quite simple, but it takes a couple of steps, which I want to walk you through. So the idea is the following. Suppose that I find some function h and some function psi which satisfy this inequality over here, where x is a point in my integration domain omega, y is a vector in Rm, and z is a matrix of size m by n. Well, then I can take any vector valued function u in my subolus space, which is the one that I really want to optimize over. And I can take y and I can plug instead of y, I plug in u. And instead of z, I plug in the gradient of u. Now, this u and the gradient are particular vectors and matrices, and so I can take this inequality and I rearrange it to obtain this inequality over here for u and the gradient. Of course, this holds for every point x in the domain, so if I integrate up, the inequality remains true. And so I obtain this integral inequality, which is almost what I want, because if now I tell you that the integral of psi for any function u in the subolus space vanishes, then I can take this term here, I can drop it, and I obtain an inequality for the value of the integral functional that I want to minimize as a function only of h. And of course, this lower bound solves for every u that I have chosen because it's arbitrary. And so in particular, it holds for the minimum value of my integral functional over the whole sub space. And what remains to be done now is to ask, well, what is the best lower bound that I can prove using this strategy? And that is simply the maximum value that I can obtain over here, where h and psi satisfy these constraints. And so just to state this a little bit more formally, the minimum value of my infinite dimensional, possibly non-convex variational problem is bounded from below by the maximum lower bound that I obtain over the choice of h and psi. Of course, now you might wonder, well, great, but can I solve this problem? Can I hope to solve it? And, and how would I do it? Well, the first thing to observe is that this maximization problem here on the right is actually a linear problem. A, a lot like the ones that we saw earlier for the finite dimensional polynomial optimization case. And it is linear because this objective function here, the integral of h is a linear function of h. And the two constraints, which are easier to look at here at the top of the slide, are actually, e, are actually linear in the function psi and the function h. Of course, the difficulty is that we have infinitely many of them because we have infinitely many choices of points x, y, and z. More challenging, we have infinitely many choices of function here, u, that we can plug into the second constraint. So let me explain a little bit how we handle the second constraint and then go back and show you how we can handle the rest. So the idea to handle this second constraint and the force of the integral uh, of psi is zero is to make a change of, va of variable. Now, the equations in this slide will look complicated, but the idea is actually quite basic. Uh, so I'm going to take a vector field phi, which takes uh, uh, omega cross Rm and spits out a value in Rn. And I will represent my phi, sorry, my psi function here on the left as this horrible expression that depends on phi, and I will call it just d phi. Now, the details of this expression are not important, but what I want to draw your attention to is this identity here at the bottom. And so the idea is that I've chosen that complicated expression in such a way that if I plug in u instead of y and the gradient of u instead of z, then I obtain the divergence of phi with respect to x minus the divergence of phi evaluated when u is zero. And this is exactly what I need, because if I then take the integral of phi and I plug in this expression with the divergence and I apply the divergence theorem, I get the integral over the boundary, but u over the boundary is zero, and so I get zero. 
Sorry. This simple change of variable actually enforces the zero integral constraints for, for uh, psi. Psi is actually in the literature on the calculus of variation is called a null Lagrangian. Um, and this will be the choice of null Lagrangians that we will consider. So after we make this change of variables, we can forget about this constraint and we can rewrite the lower bound uh, in, the in, the, in the following way. The original minimization problem that we wanted to solve has an optimal value, which is bounded from below by the lower bound that we obtain using these null Lagrangian translations, I call them. And that's because we are adding some null Lagrangian translation here to F uh, here in the constraint. Now, this maximization problem for the lower bound looks, as I said, a lot like the one that we had uh, for the polynomial optimization problem. So you wonder whether maybe there is a measure theoretic formulation. And the answer is yes. So in between these two problems, uh, there sits a uh, lower bound formulation that uses measures. They're called occupation measures. The details are not important. The one thing that I would like to mention is that having this measure theoretic formulation here gives a nice interpretation of what is happening in the slide. So the first step is a relaxation step where we replace the minimization over Sobolev space with a minimization over a larger set of objects, which are these occupation measures in here. And then we can take this major theoretic problem and apply duality theory to recover the null Lagrangian formulation. And in general, we have weak duality, so we have inequalities a priori between all of these problems. Uh, although with Ian Tobasco, we managed to prove that under very mild conditions, uh, these two lower bounding problems, so the measure theoretic formulations and the null Lagrangian translation form of the problem are actually identical. They give the same, the same optimal bound. The first inequality, the relaxation one, instead turns out to be strict in general. So what this means is that our method, although somehow very simple, is not powerful enough to capture the global minimum of our problem in full generality. But that's OK. Moreover, uh, it turns out that we can actually prove that the method is sharp. So somehow we have equality here in some particular cases. So for example, Henry On and co-authors prove that if the integral f is a convex function of u and the gradient jointly, uh, then we have equality. And so the method works really well. But we also have examples of some non-convex non problems, which are really the interesting ones, where this equality holds. So I want to give you an example, a couple of examples of that, just to show you that the method indeed does work. So first is a simple problem, minimize u, u prime square minus u square minus 2u integrated between minus pi over 3 and pi over 3, where u needs to vanish at the boundary. Now, of course, this is a simple problem that we learn in, uh, in an undergraduate class, perhaps in, in analysis. We can write down optimality conditions in the form of Euler-Lagrange equation. It becomes a linear elliptic equation. We can solve it. We can find the optimal u. And we can calculate the optimal value when it turns out to be this number over here. So we know everything about this example, but the point is to show you that these non-Lagrangian translations work. Uh, and it turns out that for this problem, I can actually come up with an h and with a phi that if you plug them into the problem and you do the calculation, satisfy the right constraint. So it turns out that this f plus the this d phi minus h, which is the quantity that needs to be non-negative, is indeed non-negative. And in fact, you see, it's almost a sum of squares, other than this denominator here, which is not square. So it is going in the direction of the sum of squares. And in particular, if I take h and I evaluate the integral, I get exactly the same number as the minimum value of my problem. So in this case, I have a lower bound, which is exactly equal to the minimum, and so it is sharp, and I've calculated it exactly. Perhaps more interestingly, it turns out that this choice of h and the choice of phi can be expressed in terms of the optimal function u for this problem over here. And this is useful because I can relate these functions to the optimizer um, and make constructions even for problems where I don't know what the optimizer is, unlike in this case. So here's another example, which is the Kahn Hilliard functional or the Modica Mortola functional, depending on uh, what uh, your, your background is. Uh, so we have epsilon times the square of the gradient of u inside the integral plus some non convex function of u 
Uh, I don't know what the optimal function is, uh, but I know that it satisfies some Euler Lagrange equation, which is a nonlinear equation, nonlinear elliptic equation. Uh, I can plug it into the computer, and the solution looks a little bit like this plot here. So the, the function u is basically equal to minus one uh, in the middle of the domain, and then it has to go to zero at the boundaries. So that's what this plot is showing you. Um, and I can use this optimizer, even though I don't have an explicit, ex explicit expression for it, in order to construct an H function and a phi function for my null Lagrangian translation bounds that give exactly the sharp answer. So the details, again, are not important. The point is the method works for many examples. Now, of course, you might wonder, OK, these are just two examples. What about the general case? How do you somehow optimize these lower bounds? How do you optimize the function h and the function phi if you don't know if, um, if, if you don't have an explicit construction? If I just give you some problem, how do you do it systematically? And of course, the answer is we use polynomial optimization. So if you look at this problem, you realize that, again, very similar to what we had in the first part of the talk, we have a polynomial, an inequality constraint here. Now, f I've assumed at the very beginning to be polynomial, phi and h are functions which, in principle, are just continuous, continuously differentiable, perhaps, but they are up to me. And I can choose them to be polynomials if I want. And if I do so, then I end up with a polynomial inequality here on some set. To proceed, I will make an assumption. I will assume that omega, my integration domain, is something called a semi-algebraic domain. And this just means that I can represent it using polynomial inequalities. And now I'm almost, um, almost finished, because basically now you recognize that you have these polynomial inequalities on sets defined by polynomials. And so the idea is exactly as previous, uh, previously in the talk. So the idea is to restrict all of the functions that you see here to be polynomials of some degree, let's say omega, so that the computer can optimize them, and then replace the non-negativity with weighted sums of squares constraints, which we can enforce computationally by solving uh, some optimization problems for which software exists. Let me just show you how this works, works in practice by uh, revisiting the examples that I showed you earlier just analytically. So again, the very simple problem here. Let us pretend that we didn't know what the optimal h and the optimal phi were, which for this example we do. Uh, and let us look for h, which is some polynomial of x. In this case, x is just a, 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 a scalar variable. So I just have all of the powers of x multiplied by some coefficients, h0, h1, and so on to h omega. And these are the variables that the computer can optimize. Uh, and for phi, let me choose y squared times a polynomial of x, which I will call capital phi of x, again, where the coefficients can be tuned by the computer. And you will see that if you optimize these coefficients and you increase the degree here omega in this plot, you see that you can compute lower bounds here that increase and appear to be converging, although very slowly, to the global minimum f star of our original problem. Now, the reason why this convergence is slow is that these polynomials here that the computer optimize converge to the optimal functions that we know of. And although h is a nice function, this phi here, this polynomial, is approximating this function here, 2 sine of x over 2 cos x minus 1. And this has a singularity on the boundary of the domain. So when x goes to pi plus or minus pi over 3, then this denominator goes to 0, and this function blows up. So I can't really approximate it very well with a polynomial. And this is why this convergence in this plot is very slow. I can do the same for the other problem, the Kahn Hilliard or Modifa Mortola problem. Again, I take polynomial h, and again, I take a phi which has this form, where this capital phi is a polynomial of degree omega. I, in this case, don't know what the explicit expression for this phi is, but the computer can construct approximations to it. And so you see here in the table that if you keep increasing the degree of this polynomial, then you compute lower bounds that increase. Uh, and for degree 30, you get a value of about 0.41, whereas the global minimum that you can approximate just by trying to solve for the optimizer is about 0.47. So these bounds are very good. Of course, the computer can also solve problems for which I don't know the answer. So for example, here, if you take this minus one 
and you replace it to a minus two, uh, then it turns out that you should look for a phi, which is a more general expression. I don't know how to handle this by hand, but for the computer, it's exactly the same. And the computational results look, uh, look, look great. Uh, and you see again that as you go through the table, the degree of these polynomials increases and the lower bounds that we compute uh, are basically sharp. So this concludes the second part of the talk and it's the one about the lower bounds on variational problems. The main takeaway message, I appreciate maybe there were a few details, but the message is that we can optimize non-Lagrangian translation using polynomial optimization, sums of squares polynomials. The method works pretty well uh, in some examples. We have proofs in some cases. Uh, in other cases, we don't have proofs, but we still see very good behavior. Um, and, um, and this is both in terms of theory, but also in terms of calculations with these sums of square certificates. So in the last part of the talk, maybe in the last 10 minutes, uh, I would like to talk about the upper bound. So how do we, how do we go about the other direction? So far I talked about the lower bounds. And again, you would think that this problem is easy because if I want to find an upper bound on a minimum, well, I just take any function u and I get an upper bound. But here the question is, how do I find a good upper bound, perhaps a convergent upper bound? So the idea here is to go back to standard numerical analysis. So what you would do uh, in, uh, in general, what many people would do is you take your variational problem, which is infinite dimensional, uh, you take the domain, let's say here a square, and you uh, triangulate it. So you divide it you, you, um, into, into triangles, you introduce a mesh, and you perform a finite element discretization, where instead of optimizing over all functions u in a subordinate space, you take the function u to be piecewise linear on these triangles. Okay, so this gives a large scale discrete problem, which we could hope to solve perhaps computationally because now it's finite dimensional. And if we refine the size of the finite element mesh, meaning that the size of the triangles becomes smaller and smaller, then we know it's just a, some standard result that optimizers of this discrete problem converge to optimizers of the original one in a weak sense and the optimal values also converge. Now, the idea is to look at this discrete problem and try to apply polynomial optimizations to it to get a good approximation for its global meaning. Now, the problem here is that this minimization problem, again, like at the beginning of the talk, is non-convex. Um, so it is difficult in general to find this global optimizer. So in order to do this, uh, let me just look at this expression and realize that I can write the integral of f as the sum of the integrals over every type of triangle. So I just chop up my domain into triangles and I sum up. And now because I assume that u is affine on every triangle, then I can plug in this affine representation and I can integrate over x. And so I can rewrite this integral as a sum function of the variables that determine u on the triangle. And so you should think of these expansion variables just as the values of u on the corners of a triangle. Uh, and then the value of u in the triangle is given by the linear interpolation of these three of three values. So we have this sum of terms, which depends only on a few variables. The, the values of u are the nodes of the mesh. And because I've assumed that the f function here is polynomial and u is affine, then I'm integrating over x a polynomial. And so the result is also a polynomial. So this function that we are minimizing over here is in fact a sum of polynomials. So I really have a polynomial optimization problem with a high degree of structure. Now, for the purposes of what I want to say next, it is actually convenient to rewrite this sum. And instead of summing over triangles or over elements of my mesh, it is convenient to combine elements into what I call macro elements. So for example, you put together elements in columns and you consider the sum over all the black ones and then the sum over all the red ones and then the sum over all the yellow ones and so on and you just combine terms in this way. I still have a polynomial optimization problem with a high degree of structure. And so you might wonder, well, shouldn't you just apply the tools from the beginning of the talk? And the answer is yes, we should do exactly that. So we should apply this moment of sum of squares relaxation with polynomials of degree order omega. Uh, 
we obtain a problem that gives us a lower bound, we can potentially recover an approximate minimizer for this problem, which I will call u star h omega, because it depends both on the size of the mesh that I've used to discretize my problem in the first step and on the degree uh, of the sum of squares polynomial that I used to build these moments on the squares relaxation. And then hopefully, if I've done it right, this optimizer here will converge to an optimizer of the discrete problem, which in turn converges to an optimizer of the variational problem that I wanted to solve. Now, this happens provided that we have the right conditions. And so in particular, for this step over here, we need two technical conditions. One has to do with the choice of macro elements. They need to satisfy something called a running intersection property. I don't want to go into the details of it. It is a technical condition. But if you choose your macro elements right, for example, if you combine them into columns like this, then everything is fine. The other condition is compactness. So the idea is that these sums of squares relaxations converge if I have a polynomial optimization problem with a compact feasible set. And now this is a problem because my original variational problem and therefore its discretization are posed over linear spaces, which are not compact. Here I have a full space, subtle space, and here I have a full subspace, which is definitely not compact. The solution is so trivial that is and, and so obvious that you might think, well, there's nothing to it uh, and, and you'd be right. So the solution is just to add some artificial bounds on the functions that we're optimizing. So artificial add infinity bounds that depend on the mesh size. So the idea is to basically put this discrete problem into a box and the box will grow as the mesh becomes finer and finer. So by putting all of these ingredients together, we can actually prove the following theorem. So we assume that the macro element satisfy this technical running intersection property. We assume that these artificial and infinity bounds become infinite as the mesh decreases. And crucially, we assume that the original variational problem has a unique global minimizer u star. Well, then what we managed to prove is that our approximation that we obtain with the sums of squares techniques converts weakly to this global optimizer in the solvable space W1P. Of course, this weak convergence doesn't tell us anything about optimal value. And the problem here is that although I have these inequalities, so the value, uh, the optimal value of my functional is bounded above by the, by the value that I obtain for my approximate optimizer, these functionals are not continuous in the W1P weak topology. So the point is that if I pass to the limit, I can't a priori uh, conclude that this value here on the right hand side will converge to the value on the left, um, unless I make some additional assumptions. And so what we've managed to do with Federico Fuentes is if we assume that the f integrand uh, can be split into some f0 component, which depends on z and is convex, and some f1 part that depends on y only, as well as x, uh, then we can really pass to the limit and we have a convergence sequence of upper bounds. So just to conclude, I know we have maybe two minutes left. I just want to show you some examples of this theory and, and show you that the method actually works in practice. So here is again this Cam Hilliard or Modica Mortola problem. You see here on the left, the true optimizer, true in the sense that it's a highly accurate solution that we find numerically. Uh, and on the right, you see the approximation that we obtain with our discretization and then relaxation uh, technique. And you already see that the pixel looks very similar. Um, and that if I evaluate the energy, uh, the functional, then I get a value which is larger than the minimum one. And if I refine the mesh, then this value goes down and it keeps going down uh, and you will eventually convert. Now in this results, I'm a little cheating. Uh, because these calculations do not enforce these technical running intersection properties of the macro elements. So actually all of the convergence theorems that we have don't apply to the calculations. And the reason why we don't do this in practice is computational cost. So here you see that uh, the time that it takes to solve these problems is pretty small. If we do not enforce this technical condition, if you do, the problem becomes intractable. So it is still an open question to understand whether it is possible to remove this condition or not. Um, this is just an open research question.
Uh, again, another problem that comes uh, from pattern formation, it is the swift Toenberg energy functional. In this case, we also have a second order derivative here, but everything that I said extends to this. This problem has many local minimizers, so there is a zoo of local minimizers that you would compute using traditional techniques. And I wanted to focus on this one here on the top left, which is the best one that we managed to find. And if we apply our technique, then uh, we get approximations that look exactly like that one for a range of mesh sizes. So the method really works well, even though there is a little bit of a gap between practice and what we can prove theoretically. So that brings me to the end of the talk. My outline is somehow also my summary. Uh, so after reviewing some tools on polynomial optimization, I've hopefully managed to convince you that we can use these tools to attack infinite dimensional variational problems and compute lower bounds as well as upper bounds for optimal values of variational problems. We have convergence proofs in some cases. We know that these bounds are sharp under certain assumptions. Um, and there are still some open questions uh, re regarding um, some of the assumptions in our theorems. Maybe we can remove some. Uh, maybe we can, uh, uh, we can improve some computational efficiency and bridge the gap between theory and computation. Uh, but uh, but for today, this is all I wanted to say. I think we are running out of time. And so I will thank you for your attention. I uh, remain available if you have any questions, you can uh, email me. And if you want to know more, uh, here are some QR codes that you can scan and you will find all of our papers either published online or on archive. So with that, I will conclude. Uh, thanks for your attention and I will welcome any questions. Thank you very much, Giovanni, for this nice talk. Now we open the audio to people that want to ask uh, something or comments, or if you want, you can write it in the chat. Nobody? Um, I, I I had some questions, but you solve it during the <laughs> the talk. So, um, like how to obtain the psi that you con you constructed in in some sense, and um, I think it's very interesting and of use, of course, at least for the kind of problems we we treat. And I was asking for the. <laughs> Also for the bibliography, and you have everything there. So <laughs> yes. So unfortunately, I think you maybe you see my chat box in front of the slide on of the slide, yeah, and I can't seem to, to be able to move it or remove it. Um, yeah. I think there might be a bug in my Zoom. Um, but so yes. So I um, there are more references that I'm I'm happy to give. Here I pointed out the works by myself, but there's also works by others. So if you're interested in the topic, uh, do send me an email and I'm, I would be happy to share more references. Okay, thank you very much. Well, if there is not uh, any question or comments, uh, we thank you again. And, thank you. Um, I think that we have to switch one to uh, stop the yes. recording. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Luz, and thank you a lot, Professor uh, Giovanni Fantuzzi, for your amazing talk. Thank you.